in this in the final chapter. We'll look at some practical steps we can take to stop child killing in our generation. But before we do, let's consider a key aspect of this spiritual battle, as well as a characteristic that will create a Josiah generation, fork lightning Christians that will tear down the high places and stop the offerings to Moloch. While there are over 6 billion people on planet Earth right now, there's a sense, from what theologians call a federal perspective, that there really are only two people, the first and then the second or last Adam. All of us were born into this world in the likeness and through the lineage of the first Adam. Fallen, locked in our ego boxes, my will be done forms the bars in our prison of original sin. But by the amazing grace of God, we can be born again after the likeness of the new and last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, where thy will be done becomes the cry of our hearts. Now listen carefully. Just as there is an upward trajectory for those who are born again in the likeness of the last Adam, as we've seen, one that takes us from strong affection to the greater love where we're willing to lay down our lives for others. So there's also a downward trajectory for those who are the first Adam. Its nadir, its lowest point? Well, there's no greater selfishness than this, that someone would lay down the life of his child for his own convenience. In the battle for life, against child sacrifice and all its many permutations, the enmity that is between the seed of the woman, the church, and the seed of the serpent, the devil, finds perhaps its greatest expression. This is where heaven and hell meet. Heaven will win, but for America, it may well be when God raises up an enemy to do to us what the Romans did to Carthage. Abraham Lincoln said in his second inaugural address, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this scourge of war may speedily pass away. But if God wills that it continue until every drop of blood drawn by the lash must be repaid by that drawn by the sword, let it be said that the judgments of the Lord are righteous and true altogether. He understood that the civil war was God's drawn sword. And if 600,000 men died on the battlefields of the Civil War for that bloodshed, what is it going to mean to America if he deals with us for the blood of 50 million babies? The only hope for a victory that preempts that level of judgment is for a spiritual revival and national repentance like Israel experienced in Josiah's reign. And while these great gifts are for the sovereign Lord to give, there is no question that we have a responsibility to prepare the way of the Lord. And that can only happen if a significant remnant, and that may, or rather should include you, become forked lightning Christians who love, who agape God, and are willing to lay down their lives for others. America is becoming increasingly ungodly, humanistic, and even pagan, in a large part because the church has become complacent, worldly, and culturally irrelevant. As Jesus made clear, when the salt loses its saltiness and the light becomes dark, it's little wonder when the culture the church is called to serve begins to rot. Most modern Christians are ignorant of the historical precedent for revival, even in the face of militant paganism. With pagan immorality being codified at the highest levels of government, there's a great need for the church to fulfill her prophetic role in resistance to idolatry.
Is it still possible for God's people to turn the tide towards righteousness? So that we don't succumb to defeatism, let's consider the dark days Israel experienced when she was in bondage to slavery in Egypt. In that day, thousands of baby boys were slaughtered by Pharaoh in an attempt to stamp out the prophetic deliverer who was about to come on the scene. Although Satan tried to do away with Moses, his life was spared and he grew to be a man within the Pharaoh's own courts. Later, Moses delivered Israel out of bondage. In Elijah's day, the prophets of Baal sacrificed thousands of the firstborn on altars in defiance of God's law. Yet Elijah slew the prophets of Baal, and God later raised up a company of 7,000 young men who defeated King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Then, just before Jesus was born, the wicked King Herod learned through the Magi that another king was about to be born in Bethlehem. A great slaughter of innocent babies ensued, yet the baby Jesus' life was spared and he grew to be the one that would deliver the entire cosmos from the bondage of sin and Satan. Often throughout redemptive history, a sense of great darkness, sometimes punctuated with a massacre of innocence, is the very womb from which God brings forth a deliverer and a great deliverance. Could history be repeating itself? Although the hour is dark for America and over 50 million children have been slaughtered, there may yet be a prophetic generation from among the survivors who will go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to confront wickedness, stop the massacre of innocence, and see our nation turn back to God. If that generation does come on the scene, here is what it must do. One, repent of all compromise. Judgment begins in the house of God. We must forsake any and all sin, particularly of a sexual nature, that feeds into this Holocaust. Complacency, love of ease, materialism, as well as other besetting sins must be taken to the cross. When we're talking about human sexuality, it's very similar to the area of abortion. They have the same thing in common, and that is human sexuality. It really goes back to the creation of men and women in the image of God. God created them to be able to have human sexuality, to not only procreate other individuals in the image of God, but to be able to train those young girls and boys in an environment to understand God and to be good citizens. When you ultimately take sex outside of that incubator, where it is designed to produce good, the next generation, to produce stability and unity, it produces exactly the opposite. It produces death, destruction. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that there's one sin that's different than anything else, and that's the sin of sexual immorality. Everything else is outside the body, the scriptures say, but sexuality, a sin like that, is against your own body. It damages you in a very unique and different way than any other sin. Number two, turn and do good. As the Lord leads, support with both your time and finances ministries of mercy that serve as an antidote to abortion and the needs and worldviews that feed into it. That can be anything from supporting an orphanage, an orphan, or the chronically poor. Abortion, after all, is deemed necessary to alleviate the problem of poverty or so-called unwanted children to helping a crisis pregnancy center or an NGO that is defending life or abstinence-based sex education, etc. There are all manner of ways you can obey God and His clear and oft-repeated commands to seek justice, love mercy, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. But as those of us in sidewalk and street ministry know, there's literally thousands of post-aborted mothers and fathers out there too. And they don't hear, you want to sign a pro-life petition. What they hear is, you murdering worthless piece of garbage. That's what they hear you say, because they believe the devil's lies. And the devil's three biggest lies are this. That isn't sin. Go ahead and sin, it won't hurt you. 
And then, ha, now that you've sinned, you can never be forgiven. You're worthless. You are so bad. Don't even think of going to God. No, no, you're, no, you're, you're just, forget it. You're bad. You're awful. Look what you've done. And those, so these moms will beat themselves up. And the devil beats them up. And they're in slavery and bondage. And some of them are in our churches, aren't they? Praying that it, the issue's not dealt with. Yeah, I love Jesus and I'm saved, but... And you know what? You've got the best news they've ever heard in their lives. Full confession, full repentance brings full forgiveness and full deliverance through the shed blood of Christ. Bring them to Calvary. Bring them to the cross. Bring them to confess their sins to Christ and watch Jesus do a great job at them. Allow me to mention something here that I trust you won't take in a wrong way. Some of us, including myself, did the wrong thing with our unwanted child. If we've truly repented, God has forgiven us. But the simple fact is we saved ourselves a lot of money by having one less child to raise. Please pray about giving some of that money or your time to support someone who may be struggling financially because they chose the right thing or in some other way overcome the evil you did with good. Uh, I had an abortion when I was 17 years old. I was um, a professing Christian at the time and believed that uh, it was okay with God. I had created a false idea of Him and I created a God in my, made in my own image, in my mind. And um, that got me through the abortion. And uh, two years later, though I had really reached the end of myself, and I was met by a few women who invited me to their church and Bible study, and I started going with them, and they showed me scripture um, about sin and being separated from God based upon the life that I was living. And that's at the point that God really convicted me that I was not with Him and uh, that I had murdered an actual person, my own flesh and blood. And at that point, I, I didn't want anything more to do with my sin and, and how I'd been living. And so I gave my life to Christ. And from there, He really has enabled me to use for good what was intended for evil. And, and that was how I felt once I had been convicted uh, by my abortion. I met uh, a woman, she was in about her mid-30s, and she um, was sitting in her car and I went up to the car to talk with her and I shared with her uh, what was happening with her baby gestationally and uh, the humanity of this child and that God forbids the shedding of innocent blood. I offered my help to her to walk her through her pregnancy and um, help her by the grace of God and she accepted that offer of friendship. Her um, son was born in December and she gave me the privilege of, of being able to name him and so I chose the name of Emmanuel because God definitely is truly with this little boy. This isn't something you have to do. It's something you get to do. That's your joy and perhaps your healing may be made full. Number three, commit yourself to the battle for life with the zeal, resolve, and understanding commensurate with the challenge before us. We must see abortion for what it is, the murder of children, and then live our lives accordingly. How would you have acted if you lived down the road from Auschwitz and saw the trains loaded with people being taken to the ovens? Would you have stood with William Wilberforce and his co-conspirators in their long sacrificial battle to stop slavery in the British Empire? We're never going to see the victory over this magnitude of satanic and entrenched evil if we're not willing to pledge our lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to the cause. We do it for him. These are his babies, and he loves them more than we ever could. See Edmund Burke. He was the British Member of Parliament during the American War for Independence. He was the one that led the charge, saying, just let the colonies go, and let's trade with them and make money. We don't need to be fighting them. He's the guy that made this statement famous. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. But he made a better statement that I really like. No one makes a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. Number four, pray. There's no one targeting false ideologies with massive fasting and prayer. 
I was rocked by the message and I, I realized that behind every false ideology are spiritual powers and they have to be addressed through the Ephesians mandate and therefore fasting and prayer really is significant in terms of standing and resisting the principalities and powers that are coming through the shedding of innocent blood. Number five, proclaim, evangelize, and disciple. The prime directive the Lord left us with was to disciple nations, teaching them to observe His commands. We can, we must do this. Listen, a lie carries within it the seeds of its own destruction, truth its own victory. Even with the occult revivals, the sexual revolution, the propaganda from the media, and Planned Parenthood, all this and much, much more, most Americans remain sympathetic to the pro-life cause. By simply proclaiming, defending, and living out the truth, we can and will see the lie exposed and ultimately destroyed. But there are a few things that need to be emphasized here. As in everything, Jesus is our model for personal and cultural transformation. We need to use wisdom and an assortment of apologetical techniques that can range from asking questions and really listening to strong prophetic challenges. We must also, like Jesus, strive to minister from a place of love, humility, or brokenness, and servanthood, ever keeping in mind that the kingdom comes first from within hearts and then spreads from the bottom up and not from the top down. We must ever be on guard against the deception of healing the wounds of sin only a little, saying, peace, peace, when there's no peace. It's all too easy to fall into the trap of thinking you're sufficiently pro-life because you vote or talk that way or have a pro-life license plate or observe Sanctity of Life Sunday in your church. But child killing is the greatest moral evil of our time and ending it demands a level of awareness, rhetoric, and action commensurate with that evil. It can't be just another issue that we lump along with, and tragically far too often beneath AIDS in Africa, or poverty, slavery, pornography, the attack on traditional marriage, or the environment, as vital as all those issues are. Someone asked me once, you know, what do you want to be known for? What do you, why you do what you do? Speaker of the House asked me one time, he says, you know, there's a lot of issues you could be involved in. There's education, housing, and all these medical, medic, medical care. I said, those are all great issues, and I care about many issues, but life is a prerequisite to every single one of them. I mean, what good is a, is a free scholarship if you're dead, or the best health care in the world if you're not around to enjoy it? Life is a prerequisite. I believe that what we're going to see with all my heart, I, even in light of all we're seeing right now, even the Supreme Court vacancies, I believe still to this day that we will see the end of the killing in America. It will happen because we're not going to stop until it does. God will never stop abortion in America, at least not with that catastrophic judgment, until enough of us pray and act like it is what it is. Murder, infanticide the sacrifice of children in our own backyards. Always remember that as Christians, we're laboring to save lives and souls. Some of the most meaningful evangelistic outreaches occur at the gates of hell, the abortion clinics of America, in regard to the people going in as well as those who work there. My name is Spring, and I have a special pre-abortion packet Really, it's, you know, God calls us to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and first and foremost, and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And if that's you, if you love God with all your heart, then you are able to come and serve in this ministry. You can, I would ask you to first come and observe, um, come and pray. It's really about being led by God. But it's not just important, it's a necessity that we have men and women come out and serve on the sidewalks outside of the abortion clinic because it is the last opportunity that you have. We see large numbers every single day of women aborting 
and they bring family members and friends and neighbors and coworkers. And this is an opportunity to not just be a voice, the last voice to speak on behalf of their baby, but as well to provide an amazing um, opportunity to share the gospel. Well, j just this morning, we showed up at the gates of hell, an abortion mill uh, here in Orlando, Florida, and we gave them heaven and, and two precious babies were saved. And we had the privilege, I had the privilege of going and having breakfast with one couple who chose life and then chose Jesus. This is, this is we win more people. Uh, to, to Christ by accident than some of the churches do on purpose when they practice all of their strategies. Uh, why? Because we show up at the gates of hell. Do you know that uh, in, in the year uh, 1991, there were over 2,000 freestanding abortion mills in this country, over 2,000 of them. Today, this very day, there are 713 freestanding abortion mills. You have to stand back and figure, well now, what piece of legislation was it that changed all of this thing from 2,000 now to only 713? 40% of those uh, doing uh, abortions, they've stopped doing abortions. Uh, Norma McCorvey, the Jane Roe of Roe versus Wade, she was the poster child uh, for the pro-choice movement and she jumped right into the arms of Jesus. I mean, you just see the enemy's kingdom being pillaged as we approach the gates of hell. Uh, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the founder of NARAL, has given his heart to Christ. He performed over 60,000 abortions. Can this Jesus do this? And how did they find out? Simple little Christians living out their faith in the streets at the gates of hell. Number six, root out of your own heart any and all of the more subtle forms of the anti-child ethos that has helped stoke the fires of the abortion holocaust. The Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord, that a primary reason that God has ordained marriage is to make a man and a woman one, that he might produce godly offspring. God's first command to mankind was to be fruitful and multiply. And yet, the majority of professing Christians in the West ignore these verses and tacitly agree with the anti-child it's all about my own convenient spirit of our age and default to having two, one, and sometimes even no children. Because I believe the world follows the church, I've said many, many times that I believe abortion on demand will end in this country when not abortion stops in the church, though it's there and we need to admit that. But when the church embraces the plain biblical teaching that children are a blessing from God's hands, then we will see the unbelievers stop slaughtering their children. When we welcome children in the church, they will welcome church children in the world. It's always, if my people will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you think about the reason abortion has been so fueled in America is because the church didn't want babies any more than the world did. We just, kept ours from coming, and they aborted theirs. It's the same kind of spirit. I'm not saying standing completely against birth control. I have seven children. But the bottom line is we never wanted the, to fulfill the first command, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And because the church wouldn't do it, the world just followed after the, the same spirit. We are as much humanists as the world. We think that children are inconvenience when if we would have been having children 40 years ago, seven, eight children, there would be no issue with the political issue of same-sex marriage. We would have had a voting block of righteousness that would have swept the whole thing away. It's our fault. It's time to turn back to the Bible. Number seven, develop vital pro-life relationships, particularly as regards your local church. If your present church is cold or lukewarm on this issue and is not open to change, leave that church and find one that is genuinely committed to being salt and light. And then find a place of service, of genuine engagement in the battle. Unity, covenantal relationships, accountability, and mutual encouragement, all are critically important in keeping your heart burning and your efforts focused, faithful, enduring, and ultimately victorious. Number eight, be faithful politically. At minimum, that involves supporting pro-life candidates for local, state, and national office, as well as putting pressure on your elected officials to support life issues. Yes, there are other important issues besides abortion, but none are more important. 
it is the only thing we are sanctioning as a society that completely denies the victim her right to her most basic constitutionally protected rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A candidate who isn't right on this issue can't possibly be a righteous ruler. As a nation, America has sanctioned child killing now for over a quarter century. It's become an accepted, deeply entrenched, and increasingly taxpayer-supported evil. Stopping it may seem to some an impossible dream. Well, it's not the first time the God of the impossible has thrust his people into impossible situations. Consider Moses as he told Pharaoh to let God's people go, or later stood before the Red Sea with Egypt's army in hot pursuit. Ask Gideon as he took on the armies of Midian, or Nehemiah as he set out to rebuild Jerusalem. And just less than two centuries ago, people said it's not possible to William Wilberforce as he took on the slave trade. Our God is a God of the impossible, one who delights in using the weak and foolish things of the world to defeat the worldly wise and powerful. And when in schools they teach about what happened on our watch, what happened right now, our children, our grandchildren, I have known this from the beginning, they're going to come home from school after they hear about the truth of what happened on our watch in the American Holocaust. They're going to come home with a question, and that question is, where were you when they were killing babies? You know what I want to answer? I want to be able to say, we were the ones who stopped it. That's where we are and we're not going to stop until we are able to say on our watch we did not let this continue. There can be no doubt that should a remnant, a Gideon company if you will, arise and obey God in regard to the truths we've explored in this presentation, God will once again hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. May the Lord help you to be one in that company. Amen.